Andrews. Lovely to see you today. Um, on this weekend, that could not have been wetter for a procession from St. Peter's to St. Andrews. As I was setting up this morning, Ray came in with some binoculars. And I did say to him, are you having problems seeing the screen at the moment? Do you need binoculars to see that? And apparently he's looking at a leak, which some of you who were here last night might have noticed in the torrential rain coming from here. And Ray had said there's always been a bit of a stain down here. Maybe this was something to do with it. But honestly, I don't think it has ever been wetter for anything that was guaranteed to get us wet. So credit to those people who actually walked. Amazing. Um, and notice this morning, um, Sam, the legend who is Sam King, is setting up in the sanctuary um, this morning to take the opportunity after the service, and I think this is such a lovely idea, for people to be able to uh, record messages to send to Derek, because Derek has not been able to join us for a very long time, so that people can say how much he's in their thoughts, and so that he can still continue to feel part of, being, uh, of this worshipping community. I really hope that as many of us as possible could spare the time to pop in there and say something. Um, and I'm sure that Sam will promise to airbrush us of our imperfections. I'm sure he can use technology to just make us all look 23 again, which would be amazing, wouldn't it? Derek will be quite shocked, but that would be a lovely thing to do, really nice. So we've got this weekend where we have uh, the tail end, if you like, and I'm, it's not a huge part of this service, but it is still part of this service, the tail end of us thinking about this half century, how can it be a half century, since St. Peter's burnt down? And if you haven't had a look yet at the exhibition over in the hub, please, please do so before it's dismantled because it has uh, a history of uh, the building, of St. Peter's building from when it uh, f was first started in the 14th century through to when it burnt down, which Rob has done. Um, there's, been, there's all sorts of memorabilia of things connected with the church. There are newspaper articles, some of which have come from Cath, um, and some that particularly interested me because as somebody who arrived in the area after the church burnt down, I often I'd stood in there and thought, I wish I could kind of feel what it was like when it had a roof and stuff in it. And even though it's after the fire, it gives you a sense of, or it gave me a sense of, what it was like when it was an enclosed building and how important it was to so many people. Um, I think that it's something that would have drawn the whole community together in a sense of loss. And I think, for me, that's, what, that's the element that I bring with me in this service today, the fact that from trauma things still can grow, really hard things in our lives and things that are difficult to manage still end up being healed. And my prayer today is that for all of us, whichever part of that journey we are in, whether we're in the valley or on the mountaintop, whether we are struggling with things that have happened to us and are happening to us in our lives, that healing and wholeness will come with that. And this is something for all of us, young and old, whatever we do, that all of us know that God puts us on solid ground. And wherever we happen to be in the journey of life, the trauma of things happening to us, or the sadnesses or the disappointments, that God has a destination in mind and that he accompanies us every step of the way. So, I've talked about Sam. And I've talked about the kind of beginning of this service. We're also pulling in Creation Tide. We're also pulling in the lectionary passage for the day. So I feel like I'm standing here doing the juggling thing. And Tim will come up when he preaches later and do a bit more of the juggling thing. But if we can go on to the next screen, Catherine, thank you. Forgive me for a little bit of Tolkien. I do like my Tolkien. And I'm thinking about journeys, all sorts of things. You could talk about, you could talk about the journey from... Um, from Egypt to the promised land that those Hebrew people did, going from trauma to promise. You could talk about Bilbo Baggins or Frodo later on, 
making their journey and their quest. And what I want us to do is to just take a moment to thank God for the journeys that we are taking. Even if at the moment, and I know for several of us, this is the case, the journey is really hard and there seems to be no easy way out of it. Let's just pray for a moment. Father God, as we gather together as your people, we gather together as one people in one place, coming from different places and through different journeys. Some of us are scarred and bruised and some of us feel that we will never shake that off. And some of us have seen the, the hope that comes and the regrowth that comes after hard times. And we put all of ourselves before you now and ask that you would take us as we are, as you indeed do, and that you would lead us forward to the place, closer to the place where you would have us be, that you would help us become the people of, for your own possession that you want us to be. We ask for your blessing, for your encouragement when times are hard, and for your persistence that we hold on to you and know the joy of life in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at, in this theme of Creation Tide, a childlike kingdom. And we're thinking about looking at what we believe and how we believe it. And sometimes we make things very, very complicated. I am reminded of a time when, uh, I think it was the first time we'd taken the children abroad, we got a gite in France. This was when I think Joe was three and Simon was five. And, um, and we were going with my sister and brother-in-law. And my sister and brother-in-law didn't have any children by then. Um, and they were really good aunts and uncles and still are. And they had brought little presents for the boys to open every evening before bedtime, little things. And this was really exciting for the boys. But being the age they were, after the first couple of days when they realized this was an everyday thing, they said, um, they said, Aunt Jill, Uncle Paul, can we have a present now? And my, I can't remember whether it was Jill or Paul who said this, they said, you mustn't ask for things. You don't get things if you ask for things. And they didn't give them their present that night. Now, I get that you have your theory about how you bring children up. But actually, the way we bring our children up is to say, if you need something, ask for it. You know, if this is, it's a, it, this, this is what we do. Or if you, if you want something, ask for it. Be open. They, children don't get the thing that adults do, which is, I really, really want this, but I'm not going to ask for it. I'll do it in other kind of sophisticated ways. Little children don't do that. So I put two crying children to bed, trying to think nice thoughts about my sister. Breathe. Um, and... I understood that actually the, the sophisticated layers that we put on as adults think about the way we think is not the way children do things. Children are very simple. This is how it is and this is what I say. This is what I want, I'll say this. And we are looking at God's kingdom as one where we are open. We don't get too complicated that we just open ourselves up to God's love. Now, if we have any children or people who are child at heart, children at heart who would like to think about our connection with each other and how we connect in an open way, I have some paper dolls. I've actually done a paper teddy here. Do you remember doing these? You have to make sure that you join the hands up because otherwise when you cut it, it won't work. I've got some I've done here. I feel like a blue Peter presenter. Um, and there are some pieces of paper that are already folded at the back. If you want to try and cut some of these and colour them in as the people who you are most connected to, who you feel most true to, who you easiest, find easiest to talk to, then those are at the back. And if you're sitting at the back and you get trampled by lots of small children, which I can't quite see happening at the moment, feel free to move. Thank you. And we're going to move on before we sing for the first time. We're going to move on to saying that we're sorry for not being the people that God wants us to be.
Human sin disfigures the whole creation, which groans with eager longing for God's redemption. We confess our sins in penitence and faith. We confess to you our lack of care for the world you have given us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our selfishness in not sharing the earth's bounty fairly. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our failure to protect resources for others. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to sing. Stand to sing if you feel able. And we're going to sing that um, age-old favourite, Great is Thy Faithfulness. sit down. Father God, thank you that you are faithful in all things, that you reign supreme, and that nothing and no place that we are is too far from you for you to scoop us up. Amen. And Barbara's going to bring us up our readings.
the first reading, Psalm 26. Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with those who are bloodthirsty, in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. I lead a blameless life, Deliver me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground. In the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. And the second reading is Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 16. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea, and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. The little children and Jesus. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. And we're going to stand to sing again before Tim comes to talk to us. Uh, God of grace.
so much Nick for thinking about singing that one again it's lovely please sit down just before Tim comes up let's pray for him as he speaks to us father God we thank you for the richness of your word for the way that we can learn and be changed and we pray for our brother Tim now as he comes up and talks to us from this passage we ask that you'll give him the words that you want him to speak that you will bless our ears and open them to the things you want us to hear and we ask that in Jesus name amen Good morning, good morning. Um, as you may have gathered from the reading already, that this is quite... Can I grab my mask? Yeah. I'm not complying with Throwing things all over. I'll start again. Good morning, good morning. Um, as you may have gathered from the passage, this is really, really strong stuff that we're going to be dealing with this morning. And before I start to deal it, I thought it probably deserves a little bit of an explanation. Um, this isn't something that we've chosen to speak on this morning. And the reason we're teaching on this is because we're on what's called the lectionary cycle, where we slowly work through, in particular, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we're slowly working through Mark, and this happens to be the passage for this week. Um, we haven't deliberately picked this because we feel that there's a specific issue that we want to teach into here. Um, however, we certainly considered about skipping this one because it's very difficult, and very strong stuff, and it may raise a lot of difficult emotions and memories for people. But actually, I felt like that was maybe just dodging, dodging a bullet somehow. Um, and there are words that Jesus has spoken in here, and I'm hoping there's still something that we can learn and understand here that can help us draw closer to God and help us to know some of his healing for us in our lives. Many of us may well have been affected by divorce in one way or another. And the intention this morning is not, lay, not to lay down the law, certainly not to try and condemn anyone, but just to bring us back to the foot of Jesus. As this is all about our relationship with Jesus. And so if we still have questions and we're unsatisfied, and even if I make a complete hash of this and I have to ask for your, your grace and mercy this morning, um, it's still about our relationship with Jesus and keeping up that prayer life, that line of communication, and asking for his help. Also, because it's quite a difficult subject, I've got no jokes this morning. Normally I would break up a, a talk with a number of different jokes, and anything I could come up with was either wildly inappropriate and not funny at all. So, strap in, it might be difficult. Could I have the... Yes, brilliant, the passage is already up there. So a little bit of context going on here. Verse 1, it talks about the territory. It talks about the place where they physically are. And this is really important. And I've asked, and it's not actually part of the reading that verse. It would have skipped it. But all the commentaries that I read seem to think it was really important. And the reason it's really important is this is the territory that John the Baptist taught in. This is Herod's territory. He is the tetrarch and ruling over this area. And actually what's already happened when this, uh, at the time of this particular bit of teaching is that John the Baptist has been executed by Herod. And John the Baptist called out Herod for his own issues, for marrying his brother's wife, for a number of other problems that Herod had, and it cost him his life. 
So in verse 2, you see there's a testing of Jesus. These Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to trip up. What they're doing is if they can get Jesus to condemn Herod, Herod may kill Jesus for them. And then Jesus isn't a problem for these Pharisees. And so what we're looking at here is a power struggle. And today we are still feeling, as we read this passage, the echoes of that awkward question that is designed and intended to bring conflict to Jesus' followers and to end Jesus' life, arguably prematurely at this point. And so there's a lot going on here. And there's a lot that affects us, but it's all brought out of this, what I would argue is a very spiteful, manipulative comment. Julie mentioned about how kids just do what they want. If you didn't like Jesus, you'd probably run up and thump him if you were a child. On the other hand, as an adult, you have to start going into the slightly more Machiavellian schemes about getting him to trip up and get somebody else to do your dirty work for you. Anyway, Jesus answers the question probably in the same way that we would answer the question. And he answers it with, what does scripture say? And what does scripture say about divorce? And it says that it's allowed, that Moses has allowed this. And Jesus doesn't say that it's not allowed. However, he explains this a little bit of, it's due to a hardness of heart. And I could probably talk exclusively on what that could mean. But I think it's probably easiest just for the time being, just to cover that with a relationship breakdown. That when there is a relationship breakdown that there has been a certain allowance for mercy and grace and a parting of two people that is extremely difficult and sad. There's a subtext there as well. It's due to a hardness of heart. It's not due to, it's not an allowance that's made that allows for promiscuity, that allows for lust, it doesn't allow for polygamy, and in particular it doesn't allow for any political kind of alliances to be made by I'm going to divorce this person because I don't want anything to do with their family or if you're very powerful their country and I want to start having a relationship with that country over there so I'm going to have an arranged marriage to do that because that's also what this is speaking into so divorce is permitted it's not the original plan or the intent but because of the brokenness of humanity and that we keep getting things wrong there is still grace and mercy to be found there. Now Jesus' assertions that follow um, also stop marriage being temporary. People should enter into marriage with the expectation and the intent to make things work. If he gave a different answer here, it would set up a completely different dynamic, that if this marriage doesn't work out, it's all right, we'll just stop that and we'll have another one, and if that doesn't work out, I'll stop and have another one much in the same way many people can jump between several different jobs, such as myself in their life, that actually there's a, it's about what do I get out of this rather than I'm intending for this to be permanent and for this to work. Again, I refer back to the bit where there can be a relationship breakdown and there is an opportunity for a second chance, but no one should be entering into marriage with the intent of using that second chance in the first place. There's always supposed to be that we want this to work and we will go the extra mile to make it work. And so before this gets a bit too personal and Herod's royal shadow that's cast over this parage, passage dominates everything, I'm going to change tack and go to the gossip columns. In the 90s, divorce was a hot topic. What's more is actually if anybody, any two people that were really struggling, maybe looking at divorce, came to someone who was in particular in a church teaching on divorce, they couldn't just go through that in a very private way, in a way where the pastor or teacher was talking to them in whatever way was tailored to them, because the giant looming question over the top of it was Charles and Diana. Could we have the crown, please? Thank you. And so whatever was happening between two people struggling in a broken, broken relationship one way or another, there was always that, but if we allow this, what does that mean for Charles and Diana? Charles and Diana had a very publicly dysfunctional relationship. And I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I don't think any of us know the full truth of what was going on. Um, and I've certainly watched The Crown and I'm very, the Crown on Netflix, and I'm very aware that it's an embellished work of fiction, but there are some key points in it. And what's more, they are, they are doing that in the shadow of Edward and Mrs. Simpson. So they've already set a precedent that actually you can't have The Crown if you've been married to a divorcee, 
and the crown sets an example, so what are Charles and Diana going to do? And this is all history that we kind of know of, but it affects, but what the people with the most amount of power are doing affects those who are struggling and the least among us. I'm going to change tack again. Marriage in the UK did not originally include clergy or legal documents apart from the extremely elite and the royals. What happened was people tended to have a hand fastening cer ceremony in their village. Slowly people wanted God's approval for that so they started to have a hand fastening ceremony in the doorway of the church. Somewhere along the line the clergy and the people in charge invited them into the to the church and they started to have a marriage ceremony much like the royal family were happening. And so you've got a kind of change of our tradition of what marriage looks like there. And so those royal marriages may look like something that a king had. Um, it's like Henry VIII, who um, I don't like to call anyone evil, especially from the pulpit, but I can't deny um, what's going on there. There's a tyrant. Henry VIII was a second son and a wild child. He uh, was never in in, no one was expecting him to be the king. His older brother was going to be the king, but he died a little bit tragically. And then Henry VIII married his brother's widow. He then thought that he was cursed because of John the Baptist accusing Herod about marrying his brother's wife. Now, because he was a wild child, Henry managed to have many children by many other people, not all of which are proven. Um, some of them he did accept as his children, um, and some of them he didn't. And he could prove that he could have sons by other people. So he seemed to think that God was cursing him for marrying his brother's wife. And so that bit that John the Baptist calls Herod out on now has an echo in the 15th century <coughs> Tudor dynasty. And he couldn't keep a son by his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. He had many other sons, um, such, as, such as Henry Fitzroy, and a bunch of other ones people sort of acknowledge are his sons that were never formally acknowledged. He proved he could have sons by other women, hence he thought God had cursed him. Unfortunately, he seems to have skipped a whole huge chunk of the rest of this passage here, where, he, um, where Jesus teaches on where sleeping around and fathering many children by many women whilst married to wife number one is clearly not the plan and not okay. Henry's complete undermining of marriage has led him to be nick being nicknamed the English Nero by Europeans. And I have to come to terms with the fact that I'm ordained in the Church of England, a church, uh, the institutional church, that there was a Church of England, but it was part of the Catholic Church previous to this, and it splits away over Henry's great matter, his divorce. And I think that in particular wasn't just about a hardness of heart and a relationship breakdown, but those things I said before about wanting, about lust, about political alliances, Henry's whole marriages were just, I think we can all agree, they are terrible. <laughs> there is um, many reasons that people's relationships break down, and Henry's are not good ones. And so the C of E seems to be born of Henry's problems, of Henry's sin. However, my only solace in that is that the Church of England seems to be reforming over and over and over again and continually reforming that there is a, hopefully a work happening, not just in this denomination of church, but in many denominations of church, to be slowly changing towards what God's plan and intent is for that church and slowly changing towards the kingdom of God from an institution designed by people to get their own way. So that's what I'm going to talk about on divorce to start with. And also on marriage, there's something there about grace and mercy being available, that divorce is still there, but nonetheless there's still an intent and a calling in marriage. And I'm very sorry if this has raised issues for people and is very difficult. Now the next part... Um, all of a sudden, with no segue whatsoever, we skip and we start to focus on children. And I wonder if that's not because there's no segue and no link from the divorce issue into the who is the greatest, it's the children part of the passage, because there's not supposed to be one. It looks like there's a change of topic, but what if we don't change the topic? What if we sit with those things that we've already learned, we've already heard from Jesus? 
What if one of the biggest concerns of divorce Jesus has is the children? It's those other people that are affected. That us as a community, when there are relationship breakdowns, we can stand with people, we can do with whatever we can do, do whatever we can do to help them. But Jesus' greatest concern is the most vulnerable among us. And so, two weeks ago, the disciples asked, who is the greatest? Last week, Pauline illustrated brilliantly for us, because it was in the passage, again, who is the greatest? It's the children. And so for the third time this week, who is the greatest among us? It's the youngest children, the most vulnerable. And Jesus is calling them to come to him. And no matter what messes we make in our lives, whatever relationship breakdowns we have, we mustn't create obstacles for young people to be able to come to Jesus, to find healing, to find truth. And maybe our calling is also to be looking after them, looking after those who are struggling with somebody else's problems. So therefore, let's make, let our decision-making be tempered by the vulnerable, be tempered by grace and mercy. Because when we look at Jesus, for an illustration that's not in this passage, for so, that's somewhere else in the Bible that I should know, but I haven't got the reference offhand, is that God calls all of us to be the bride of Christ. There's many things in the Bible that are sort of slightly more seem to be more pro-male. We can look at Jesus and see that he's treating women in a much better way than usual. But men, buckle in for this one. We're going to be the bride of Christ with the women and take on that role. And Christ is the groom in that situation. And so no matter how much we get it wrong, no matter our brokenness, no matter our vulnerableness, he's doing all the things that he talks about. Could we jump to the picture of two people together? That's the one. Bit scary and intimidating with Holbein's picture of Henry staring down at us. Um, where he is always intending for this relationship to work. That he is going the extra mile to make this relationship with us work. And we see that in the cross. We see that in giving us more and more second chances. And we see that in his faithfulness to us. And so all we can do is look at Jesus and see him as a perfect partner, not as a romantic partner for us, but as someone who loves us unconditionally and his plan was always for us. Amen. Thank you, Tim. We're going to have some sung worship again but just before we do let's just reflect on some of those things about coming from a place of brokenness and living in a world that is not necessarily the way that we would want it to be and I just want a moment of quiet for us to dwell on where we are and about how God could minister to us in that let's just have quiet for a moment and then I'll finish that in a, a very short time Lord, you know where we are. You know us through and through. You know the things that make us struggle. You know the way we find it hard to adapt. You know how much the opinion of others matters to us. You know how little we consider your opinion being of value. We bring ourselves before you and we ask that you forgive those parts of us and build us up and help us know the love you have for us and lead us on. Amen. So we're going to sing again. Thank you, Tim. We're going to start with celebrate and then we're going to go on to the joy of the Lord is my strength. A few days ago, um, Tim said to me, um, we haven't done Celebrate the Joy of the Lord in ages. And I thought, ooh, yes, we haven't. And 
then I read the passage for this morning, and this the, the bit about let the children come to me, and I think sometimes we need to come to God as children in our worship, because um, sometimes I think we we can we can lose that that excitement, that joy. Um, I'm I'm really privileged that once a week on a Tuesday I have um, year eight and year, uh, and year seven we alternate and we're teaching them songs. And um, actually the songs that they really love are their own collective songs because they're so catchy and they're so simple to sing. And, and these are, these both are our own collective. And I think let's let's try and imagine that we're we're we've got that joy of of being a child singing and um, and praising because I think. It's a really good thing to do, and sometimes when we do that.
watch you around me. Your ways do remain. My courage in the fight. Walking up all my rain. Jesus, I am coming. Walking on the waves. Reaching for your heart. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy Please do sit down. Barbara's going to come and bring us our time of prayer. It might require a little more input from you than normal. I'm not going to lead the prayers in the normal sense at all today. We're meant at this point to be praying for others. And the illustration here is very much about the way people who really cared about someone brought them to Jesus. So I am going to ask all of you to speak out just very simply and briefly situations, either people or situations locally, nationally, internationally, that you would like to bring to Jesus. And Julie's going to keep record of what has been asked. And then we are going to ask you as a congregation to pray for those things. But the, the thing is, we ask that it is simple, one-sentence prayers. We don't want anyone to feel left out because someone's gone on so long that there isn't time for them. So, at this point, it's over to you. What would you like prayed for this morning? Just speak them out. I'm going to start with people who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Sorry. Okay. So right, basically, people, the people pe in oppressive regimes. Really, yes. That generally, yeah. Yeah. So can we say new beginnings generally? Sorry. New beginnings. Can we make that those who are isolated? Yeah, in whatever that's way. Right, isolated. Mm. Things that are hard to solve. The homeless, the I'm going to add the wisdom to know what to do for those who rule. <laughs> Shall we lead to that? Yes, I think so. Okay, so I'm just going to start with a very simple prayer to open this, and then, as I say, it's over to you. One sentence prayers, please. 
Father, you call us to intercede, to stand before you and bring others to you who may not be able to bring themselves. So, Father, as we pray about these topics and maybe others in our hearts that, that really matter to us, we know that you promise that you will listen and you will answer. Thank you, Father. Father, we pray for new beginnings, for all sorts of new beginnings, for the, the, the new life arising as people expect babies, for new beginnings of new jobs, for new beginnings of a new relationship. Father, we pray that each of those will be surrounded by your wisdom and strength and love. Amen. And Father, most of all, in all these situations, throughout this nation and throughout the rest of the world, we pray for wisdom for those who have to make the decisions that affect so many. Amen. These and all our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Can we skip on to the Lord's Prayer? Thank you. And let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the special prayer for today, as part of Creation Tide. O oh God, you ever delight to reveal yourself to the childlike and lowly of heart. Grant that, following the example of St. Francis, we may count the wisdom of this world as foolishness and know only Jesus Christ and him crucified, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, we are going to uh, now have a, an act of commissioning for a new beginning that's happening within this church. So I'd ask Andrew if you'd like to come up and work with that. Uh, 
I think I've probably got four things to share. Is that okay? Yep. Um, how much have we said about St. Peter's in the service? We referred to it at the beginning. We've had um, a really profound time uh, over the last few days. We had a Holy Communion at St. Peter's where we connected with the many centuries of worship that have gone on at St. Peter's with a simple act of Holy Communion, breaking bread and drinking wine. And then uh, on Saturday, when we probably should have had uh, a snorkel and flippers, uh, we, we had a walk of witness. Um, and it, it was, we had our little candles, our little night lights, and we walked and uh, from St. Peter's to the village hall because we wanted to say thank you to the people of Alsford for their hospitality in accommodating the church when it had no building because it had burnt down in the village hall. And actually, we then prayed again just outside St. Andrews for those who had the drive and the determination and the desire and the faith to build again. And the lesson is that... Um, the gospel message takes tragedy and moves it to triumph. Good Friday to Easter Sunday. And over the months as I was praying about Mark in the 50th, the scripture that came through was the Nazareth Declaration where Jesus takes the book of Isaiah and talks about beauty for ashes, the oil of gladness instead of the uh, spirit of despair. So that's the journey we've been on saying that God is bigger than the building and actually sometimes in tragedy we are called to become a pilgrim people and as we are pilgrim people fresh new things unexpected things can happen and then as the people built St Andrews there's then the call to rebuild the vision and to renew the vision so that's been our journey which Today is part of just a simple all-age service, but we've got our St. Peter's exhibition. Please have a look. And then we need to say, Lord, how can we use St. Peter's Churchyard for your kingdom? There's also already a great ministry of um, doing interments there, and we know that that's a great comfort to, to folks. But it might be that we set up a Friends of St. Peter's, and we have some pet services there, and we have some messy church, and we say, Lord... How can we use this for your glory? So I think this weekend has been about marking 50 years, but also about giving thanks, reconnecting with those 800 plus years of worship, and also saying, Lord, what are you calling us on to? So as we say goodbye to Charlie, we're also saying, Lord, what are you calling us on to? And um, I'd like Valerie to come forward. Valerie's going to help with our youth work. And we have some other people signed up. We have Meg, Catherine, um, Pete. Where's Pete? Pete, would you like to come forward? Because what we want to do is model... As praying before a service, praying before a ministry, looking for God to resource us and equip us for the task ahead. And these dear people, um, headed up by Valerie, are going to give themselves to the work of our youth work. And the youth are going to be in for an all-age service, so as per today. And then on the other Sundays... Now, the second, third and fourth Sunday, they're going to go out into the hub or the, the sanctuary for their youth time. Um, Pauline and Tim, would you mind coming forward as we pray a commissioning on these dear people? Should we just spread our hands around so we can cover everybody?
And Valerie said, Andrew, I, I've got a heart for our youth. I'm just wondering if, if God's saying something. And by Valerie stepping forward for youth work, it means that she's stepping back from leading and preaching. She's having to say to John, John, I'm sorry, I can't be alongside you now. So the two other churches in our benefice are sacrificing John and Valerie's ministry to them to give Valerie to us for our youth ministry. And Lord, we thank you for Catherine and Meg and Pete who are standing alongside Valerie and saying, Lord, show us your ways. Lord, they are offering their hearts to you and their hearts to our youth. Lord, bless them and guide them. We pray in Jesus' name and by your Holy Spirit we bless them. Amen. Amen. One of the challenges of new seasons and new chapters is that as God calls us on and as we recognise green shoots and growth, sometimes people have to be honest and reflect and say, actually, I don't think that's for me. And sometimes that can be through really tough stuff they're working through. And sometimes that can be about... Um, where we might have failed them. And I'd like to share with you that uh, Nick and Sarah have decided to close the chapter on their time at St Andrews. And obviously that's tough for us because they are a beautiful family with Esther and Bethany and Joey. And we've prayed with them and we've walked with them for so many years but they feel that now is the time to step back from St Andrews and they're not quite sure where they're going to go and worship next. But they shared that with me. Uh, we arranged a meeting just to talk through next steps. And as they shared with me, as hard as it was, I actually had a piece. And I said, normally what we'd like to do is the folks like yourselves who've just pulled yourselves out, we want to get you up the front and bless you and commission you and, you know, really say a big thank you. And they want to go without a fuss. I think we need to respect that. But also I think it'd be lovely to come up with a really appropriate leaving gift. It's going to be hard to find an appropriate leaving gift because they've given us so much. But the, the sense I had was that actually I needed to release them in Jesus' name. Church is not about the golden cage. It's about loving people and releasing them. And they're going to be a wonderful gift to another church. It's our loss, but we bless them and we release them in Jesus' name. And that's the prayer I prayed for them. So I'd like us to think about just putting some money together and just thinking of a really thoughtful, prayer-inspired gift to give them, to give thanks for the journey that they've been on with us and as they journey on. I think it, it's a hard thing to share and it was hard for us to grapple with as a PCC, but you need to be aware that that's a similar story for Ben and Amy and uh, I know that they had a season of discernment but I, I'm fairly clear in my mind that, that that's the, the story for them and I think we need to have a collection for them so we're saying some goodbyes as well as some hellos and we're journeying but we have a sense that God is with us in all it all of it one of the people we've been at a distance from is Derek and he's felt that distance keenly and I went to see him this week, and uh, he loves us, and uh, he wants to be with us, and at the moment, that's, that's really difficult. I've asked Sam for a favour, 
And I said, you've, you've let people know? So if you want to do a 10 second sound bite, Sam will capture that on a video and we'll put a, a CD or a DVD together. Today, we have rejoiced in our all age service. We're also looking at the tragedy and the triumph of St. Peter burning down and us being called forward to be a pilgrim people. We've done the commissioning of some beautiful people who are prepared and to walk with our youth. We know we need to look at redeveloping our children's work. I wonder if there's someone out here who's called to serve in that way. Praise the Lord, we've uh, got our mums and dads and toddlers up and running again, which is wonderful to see, but that'll develop over time. So we take this banner of going from St. Peter's through the flames by the dove of the Holy Spirit to St. Andrew's, and we've got the exhibition at St. Peter's after the service, but I'd just like to uh, close in prayer. And then have back to Julie, if that's all right. Heavenly Father, on the road to Emmaus, your son walked as a stranger and heard the tragic events of the passion. And then he opened the eyes of those pilgrims on the road to Emmaus to how you hold all things in your hands and have brought beauty from ashes gladness from despair and Lord in the mixed emotions of being church of failing of persevering of trusting of walking of falling and of picking ourselves up again Lord we thank you Lord Jesus that you walk with us Thank you for your living word. Thank you that the gospel is bigger than the building and you call us forward as a pilgrim people. Lord, in this new season, resources and equip us as you have done with our youth team. Lord, may we know your resourcing for this season, that we may see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And if any of that you want to talk through or pray through, Pauline, myself, Tim, Julie, ministry team, we're happy to chew that through with you. What do we need to do now, Julie? Uh, we're going to Great, let's worship. And it seems after that commissioning there, it seems very appropriate, appropriate to sing the blessing. So let's sing this. God, but also to each other.
generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children, His favor be upon you, and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children, may His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The peace of the Lord be always with you.